Today we will be looking at a case from the start of the 20th century. So sit back as we go to Belgium. In 1906, Françoise van Kalk was living on the corner of Boulevard Baudouin and Chaussée d'Anvers in Brussels in Belgium. Although still a young woman, she had already faced numerous challenges in her life. She was an unmarried mother of a seven-year-old little girl in a society that often discriminated against women in her position. The child's father was a skilled typographer employed by the Le Soir newspaper. However, when he learned that Francoise was pregnant, he abandoned her and had never seen his daughter. The little girl was named Jeanne. She was a bright, happy and curious child who was described as intelligent and polite. She lived mainly with her grandparents at number two Kwa O Pierre de Thai, very close to her mother's residence. The situation worked out well for Francoise, as she worked long hours most days. In early 20th century Belgium, it was often challenging for unmarried mothers to find stable employment, as they frequently encountered harsh judgment from employers. Many were reluctant to hire such women, often viewing them as unreliable or less committed. But with the help of her parents and her own determination and resilience, she was able to maintain a steady source of income, which was crucial for her own and Jeanne's well-being. Despite Jeanne not living with her mother, she would visit her on most evenings. She would walk the short distance to the corner of Boulevard Baudouin and Chaussée d'Anvers with her grandfather, and they would spend about three hours together. Jeanne's grandfather was a very kind and pleasant man, who laboured tirelessly, During the day he worked on the Brussels tram and in the evening he sold tickets at a theatre. There were occasions when he returned home late and had to rush to get there. One such occasion was Wednesday the 7th of February 1906. The day had been a particularly busy one for Jeanne's grandfather who was delayed returning home from his work on the tram. This delay meant that he couldn't accompany the little girl to visit her mother and he gently explained to Jeanne that he had to go to his other job at the Royal Flemish Theatre and promised that the following day he would take her to see her mother. Jeanne, however, was a determined little girl. She knew the way to her mother's house. It was not far, just a few blocks. She had walked there so many times before, although she had always been accompanied. She told her grandfather that if she did not go, her mother would be worried, and that as he was in a hurry to get to work, she could easily go there alone. After all, she was now seven years old, and it wasn't late, only 6.30pm. Somewhat reluctantly, her grandfather agreed. He knew that at some point Jeanne would have to be let out on her own, and as he had to get to the theatre, on this occasion, he would let the little girl make her own way to her mother's house. Pleased that her grandfather had entrusted her with a short journey, Jeanne put on her coat and hat and stepped outside. Despite the cold and darkness, she seemed happy as she walked along the cobbled streets. She passed by shops and curiously peered into their windows. To any observer, she appeared to be a confident and fearless young girl. Around a quarter to midnight, a machinist from the Alhambra Theatre named Josef Ellen Bosch was walking home with his son when he saw a suspicious package outside the door of 22 Rue de Hirondelle. They exchanged uneasy glances, wondering what it might be. After a brief discussion, they decided to fetch a nearby duty policeman. His name was Gustave Van Damme. As the young policeman examined the package, he was joined by his colleague, Pierre Noël. Confused and uncertain about the nature of exactly what it may contain, the two officers decided to carry the strange package to the police station for further inspection. At the station, the item was promptly handed over to the department chief, who scrutinised it closely. He immediately sensed that something was not right. The unusual looking item aroused his suspicion. After a moment of consideration, he asked Pierre Noel to open it. Cautiously, the young officer began to untie the hemp cord that encircled the package. He peeled back the layers of thick paper to reveal its contents. The first thing they all saw was a blue pea coat and a checkered dress. As they looked closer, a chilling discovery unfolded before their eyes. They found frozen blood and to their horror, the still warm dismembered corpse of a little girl The legs were missing. Just as the grim discovery of the dismembered body was being assessed, the atmosphere at the police station grew even more tense, as two distraught individuals arrived to report the disappearance of a seven-year-old young girl named Jeanne van Kalk. 
As they did, their voices trembled with fear and worry. When asked what the child had been wearing, they replied a white apron over a checkered dress and a thick woolen hat and coat. The officers listened intently, their minds racing with the troubled possibility that the description of the missing child's clothing matched the clothes found on the dismembered body discovered in the suspicious package. A tense silence filled the room as the seriousness of a situation began to sink in and the weight of the potential connection pressed heavily upon them. The department chief instructed that a message be immediately dispatched to awaken the commissioner and the public prosecutor. He wanted to ensure that they were informed of the grim discovery. The commissioner took immediate action and wasted no time in alerting the press. Reporters then converged on the police station to try and get all the details regarding the little girl whose life had been ended in such a brutal manner. The city was usually quiet at this hour, but was now filled with activity as officers and journalists prepared themselves for an investigation that promised to not only grip the local community, but also captivate the entire nation of Belgium. The next day a large crowd gathered outside the police station. Among them was Francoise van Kalk, who upon hearing the news of her daughter's death, collapsed in shock and grief. The cause of Jeanne's tragic demise was swiftly uncovered by the coroner. According to the detailed reports, the girl had been coerced into consuming a significant quantity of alcohol, an act of cruelty that left her vulnerable to further abuse. The subsequent findings revealed that she had tragically choked on her own vomit during the assault. The examiner's analysis of how cleanly and precisely her legs had been severed led to a chilling conclusion. Only someone with specialised knowledge, possibly a doctor or a skilled butcher, could have performed such a meticulous dismemberment. As the investigation progressed, the medical examiner focused on the time frame of her death. He estimated it to have occurred between 8 and 9 p.m. This narrow window provided crucial insights into the sequence of events that led to Jeanne's untimely demise. Police officers went over the gruesome details. They theorised that it was likely that the perpetrator intercepted Jeanne along the usual route that she would take with her grandfather to her mother's house. This route, however, was normally bustling with activity as it went along a main street and across a busy square, thus offering little opportunity for someone to abduct a little girl without being noticed. The fact that Jeanne would not have had to have deviated into any side streets puzzled investigators, as it implied a brazen act committed in plain view of potential witnesses going about their daily business. The community was shaken to its core by the brutality of the crime and the precision with which it had been executed. As authorities delved deeper into the investigation, the hunt for answers intensified, driven by determination to bring justice to Jeanne and closure for her grieving mother. It was now very noticeable in the streets of Brussels that no child was seen walking alone, as concerned parents kept a vigilant eye on their young ones. The funeral was held on the 11th of February and witnessed an extraordinary turnout, with over 10,000 mourners in attendance. Emile de Mott, the esteemed burgomaster, led the procession. He personally oversaw the collection of the body from the mortuary at Saint-Pierre Hospital. The atmosphere was tense and police officers were stationed to guard the coffin amidst the emotionally charged crowds, whose shouts of anger reverberated through the streets. Emile Rossel, the owner of the newspaper Le Soir, where Jeanne's father was employed, published an appeal for donations. His aim was to fund not only a suitable gravestone for Jeanne, but also a fitting monument to her. The response was overwhelming, with nearly 1,000 francs being collected. This generous amount allowed for the creation of a white marble tombstone, featuring an engraving of Jeanne's face, as well as a lasting monument dedicated to the little angel of Rue de Hirondelle, a title lovingly bestowed on her by the people of Brussels. Following the funeral, the search for clues that could lead to finding the perpetrator of this most horrible crime continued. The canals were dredged as police desperately hoped to try and recover the missing legs and tracking dogs were employed in the area where the package had been discovered. Investigators were convinced that there must have been witnesses to Jeanne's abduction. If the perpetrator had been someone she knew, someone with whom she willingly walked, surely people would have seen them together. Authorities appealed to the public for any information, hoping to uncover crucial eyewitness accounts that could provide a breakthrough in the case. They were puzzled over how the package containing Jeanne's torso was left in the street without arousing suspicion. 
The entire macabre event seemed to defy logic, and there were many questions about how such a heinous act could have been carried out in a bustling city, without anyone seeing anything suspicious. On the 15th of February, Jeanne's boots were found. This caused great public interest, and only intensified the sense of urgency and despair that shrouded the investigation. The following day, a gardener made a harrowing discovery in the Royal Steubenberg Park Farm. Two small packages, each measuring approximately 40 centimetres. Upon opening them, the true horror was revealed. They contained the severed legs of a little girl. The press was now starting to question the investigation and wondered if enough was being done to find the perpetrator of this most horrible crime. The Belgian government announced a reward of 20,000 Belgian francs for anyone who could identify the murderer. They even offered leniency to individuals who were indirectly involved if they came forward and helped to find the person who had killed seven-year-old Jeanne van Kalk. The police employed every resource at their disposal. A skilled police dog was brought to the crime scene to aid the search. The dog led them to the place where the package contained the torso had been discovered, then to another house, and finally barked persistently in front of Jeanne's grandparents' residence. Despite a few promising leads, the investigation hit several dead ends. A Spaniard and an Algerian were taken into custody, only to be released without charge due to lack of evidence. A young butcher's apprentice, who was well known for begging in the streets, was also arrested, but again released soon after. Adding to the mystery, a bloody shirt was found, which momentarily shifted the focus of the investigation. A man named Dr. Nisson emerged as a person of interest. However, despite the intense scrutiny, the police could find no actual evidence to directly link him to the crime. The case continued to baffle the authorities. Each potential lead disappeared into a maze of unanswered questions and unresolved tensions. The community remained on edge. Their hope for justice was starting to fade, with the chilling realisation that a dangerous predator was still at large. The media continued to question the investigation. They suggested that it appeared likely that Jeanne was familiar with her assailants. They reviewed the little girl's journey that night. The distance between her grandparents and her mother's house was short, and the press believed that the killer didn't take the victim far, as law enforcement was always very vigilant about nighttime movements of suspicious items, and the killer would have been aware that they risked being caught if a wrapped torso had been transported very far. There was also never a thorough search of the buildings within the vicinity of the place where the package had been found or the house where Jeanne's grandparents lived. The other residents who lived there had also not really been interviewed. The press also believed that the body's presumed dismemberment in stages suggested that the culprit may have been unnerved during the initial disposal on Rue de Rondel. However, after a few days, they were feeling more confident, so disposed of the remaining evidence. It also emerged that critical testimonies were overlooked solely due to their sources being children. One of Jeanne's friends had told the police that she had seen her at around 7pm on the evening of the tragic incident. She said that Jeanne was accompanied by a man dressed in a suit and it seemed as though the man was someone she knew and trusted. However, the girl insisted that they were not walking in the direction of Jeanne's mother's house. This observation was corroborated by the children, who had also witnessed this strange man with Jeanne on the 7th of February 1906. However, despite the potential significance of these eyewitness accounts, they are unfortunately not pursued further by the authorities. The oversight raised questions about whether crucial leads were missed in the investigation. The case quickly gained international attention, with newspapers across Europe sensationalising the story. The horrifying notion that someone could commit such an atrocity against a child sparked widespread panic. As weeks and months passed, it became more apparent that the police were not going to catch the person responsible for the gruesome crime. Public confidence in the authorities diminished, as each passing day brought no new leads or arrests. The case grew cold, and the community's hope for justice slowly faded. The failure to solve the murder not only left the victim's family in perpetual anguish, but also cast a long shadow over the police force, leading to intense scrutiny and criticism. With the perpetrator still at large, the community remained forever scarred, knowing they could no longer let their children go out alone. Towards the end of the year, the police were doing very little to find the person who had murdered Jean Van Kalk. 
on Sunday the 1st of December 1907, another young girl went missing, six-year-old Annette Bellot. She had been playing that afternoon with her older brother in Anderlecht, an area in the southwest part of the city. Around 7pm, a man approached the children and asked the boy to fetch him some cigarettes, promising sweets as a reward. He said, leave your little sister with me, then you'll be faster, I'll take care of her. Trusting the stranger, the boy accepted the offer and went to get the cigarettes. When he returned, both the man and his sister were gone. The following day, Annette's body was discovered in a meadow close by. The tragic event sent shockwaves through the community, reigniting fears that had barely subsided since the murder of Jean Van Kalk. The similarities between the two cases were unmistakable, causing widespread panic and suspicion. Parents grew even more protected of their children, and the streets, once vibrant with the sound of play, again became eerily quiet. The authorities, already criticised for their inability to solve Jeanne's case, faced mounting pressure to catch the perpetrator responsible for this latest atrocity. Once again, a solemn funeral procession made its way through the streets of the city, marking another heartbreaking chapter in Brussels history. The people were deeply moved by the tragedy and rallied once more to collect funds for the memorial in honour of the young victim. The community's solidarity and determination to commemorate a young life demonstrated the profound impact that the deaths of these two little girls had had on them. The police investigated the murder of Annette Bellot and recognised striking similarities to the circumstances surrounding Jeanne Valcalc's case. Despite their efforts, they failed to bring Annette's killer to justice. These chilling incidents have left an indelible mark on Brussels, evoking a sense of unresolved justice and lingering unease. The passage of over a century has only served to magnify the mysteries, emphasising the ongoing challenge of trying to uncover the answers of these two tragic events that continue to haunt the city's history. Hello everyone. And thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have. And I hope to see you all again in the next brief case 